slept still within the ship as waves did toss about as Peter, James and even John let out a fearful shout they thought God see Plunge them into death That they could see That sleeping there Was God in human flesh He woke to find Their unbelief Had drawn crashing on my soul. God has spoken, Christ is all, and he has made me
Morning again. I was told to change off the water if Tom didn't do it. I'm so thankful to be with you all. Thankful for the message the Lord gave Todd and David. I remind you what I said last night. I'll be saying some of the things David said last night again and um, I'm reminded that if it's true, it's not new. My pastor told me that one time. And uh, if, it's, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. The truth of the Lord is, is everlasting, isn't it? So we, would, we desire to hear one thing, and that's the Lord's truth. So I, I pray the Lord causes us to hear his truth this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Let's read our text here in Luke 10, verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I titled this message, One Thing Needful. One Thing Needful. We see the contrast of these two women. We have on one hand Martha who is cumbered about with much serving. She's full of care. She's troubled about many things. And then we have, her, we have uh, Mary on the other hand who is seated and she's hearing the word of the Lord. She's at his feet. That's the one thing needful, isn't it? To hear his word, to be placed at his feet, to hear what he has to say, for he has the words of eternal life. Now, I understand that this is a physical account, but there's also spiritual application throughout the word of God for most, if not all, of the physical accounts that are given. You and I have one thing needful when it comes to uh, the truth of the Lord, and that is for him to cause us to be seated, to cause us to be listening, to cause us to hear. He has to enable us to do all of these things. Either we are troubled and full of care, or we are given the one thing needful that only the Lord can feel. Now, every one of God's elect are given the same need in time. They are made to hunger after the bread of life. They are made to uh, thirst after the fountain of living water. They are made to need him alone. I'm sure that Martha 
was unintentionally uh, ignoring the Lord as he was there. She was busy trying to, and you can imagine the, the setting. She was really trying, uh, perhaps not to impress the Lord, but as uh, some of us know, when you're going to host, you want to have everything looking good, and you go to extreme measures to do so. She was really trying her best, wasn't she? And isn't that true with all men in religion? Spiritually speaking, they really try their best. They don't realize that they've never been given the one thing needful. They've never seen that their best is not good enough. Aren't you glad for the allegory here that shows us what we need from the Lord? We need him to cause us to need him. We need him to cause us to need him. Otherwise, we would be like Martha and be burdened about with so many things and yet never have the one thing needful. I said this last night, but I wrote this down again. Either we're made beggars or we're made braggers. And the spelling of the two is not far off from each other. You just change the A and the E around and you add an R and you have bragger or you have beggar. Who maketh thee to differ? It's the Lord that does it. It's the Lord that does it. Turn with me to Luke 18. Here we heard this last night, but we have the parable of the The Pharisee and the publican. Look with me, Luke 18 and verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven and smote, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. First of all, we see the audience of our Lord, who he's speaking to. It's they that believed in themselves that they were righteous. They were righteous. Notice the distinct difference, though, in the confession between the Pharisee who is righteous and the publican. The Pharisee says, I, 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 it's all about I. It's all about me. And in religion, is it not true that every... And some of you who were perhaps in religion, you remember you had to sit a little bit higher than everybody else so that God would notice you. You weren't weren't as bad as so-and-so, you weren't really that bad. It wasn't that the logic or the idea. If I do more, I'll sit a little higher than my peers are. I'll be observed as better. I'll have some kind of righteousness. And yet we see when it comes to the Lord that there's none good. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. We heard last night. Though the distinct difference is the Lord must give one thing needful. He must give the need that only he can fill. And he only gives that need to his people. That's what he gave to the publican, wasn't it? The publican knew where the problem was. It was a heart problem. He smote upon his breast. He was made a mercy-begging sinner would not lift up his eyes unto heaven. But he said, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Now, there's there's no pride in begging. And I want to say this as clear as I can. Um, I I don't, uh, we are to humanitarily uh, do the best we can for our fellow man in love and compassion. But, you know, there's some that are going about, they're begging, they're, they're homeless by choice. They do these things by their own choice. And I certainly would not say anything against, uh, you know, those that are in poverty, those that are in need, we should help. But as best we can, as, as unto the Lord is able, as he's made us to be. But some, as I have seen in my experience, and you've probably seen in your experience, they beg in order to obtain, and once they've obtained, they brag about it a little bit. I know a guy that Um, he got a new pair of shoes because he made somebody feel really guilty about the shoes that they had on. So they went and bought him a pair. And he walks around the place I frequent and he says, look at these shoes I got. Look at these shoes I got. I, 
I, uh, he'd been, you know, begging there for a while. He could get a job, but he just chooses not to. But he did that, and now he's bragging about it. There's no bragging in begging. A beggar comes empty-handed with one need, one thing needful unto the Lord. We don't come saying, Lord, I'm, I, I need you, therefore I've obligated you to help me. I'm, I'm worse than so-and-so, so I'm obligating you to help me. No, the beggar has nothing to offer, not even in their, their state of being a sinner or a state of being a beggar. No, we're completely dependent upon him. We come with an outstretched, empty hand unto him, not offering him anything, not offering him anything. Men will actually justify themselves because they say they're sinners. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm just a sinner? Well, I, you know, I, 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 by nature, I'm just a sinner. That's why I did that. They're justifying themselves because of what they are, not the mercy beggar. No, the mercy beggar says, have mercy on me, the sinner, the sinner. If we knew and if we've been made to know and to see the holiness of our, some uh, I'll say this hesitantly, some of the holiness of God, realizing by, by grace, through faith, how, how high and lifted up he is as Isaiah saw. We'll be like Isaiah. We'll realize we're the, we're the vile one. We'll realize the word sinner is not a compliment. It's the worst creature upon the face of the planet, isn't it? That's what a sinner is, and that's what the Lord makes his people realize. I have no hope in myself, in my flesh. In me there dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. I've got to have Christ. We come for one thing, the righteousness of Christ, made to realize he is the one thing needful. He is the one thing needful. Now, unless God makes this need, we will brag, as this Pharisee did, we will brag ourselves all the way to hell. I would remind us that in the day of judgment, many will stand before the Lord, and what will be their confession? I have done many, many wonderful works in your name. I've even cast out demons in your name. I've done all these things. I, I, I. They're not begging. They're bragging. I take great comfort in knowing every person that came to the Lord begging for mercy, begging for help, begging to be saved. The Lord met that need. He met that need. We're mercy beggars, brethren. We know it's all of grace. It's all of grace. And it's all of grace that we're justified. Look what he says in verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now understand something. The cause and effect here. If we believe, it's not to become justified. If we believe, it's because we've been justified. If we come to Christ begging, we come to the Lord not to obligate God to save us, but because he's already saved us. That's why we beg. He, he's given us the beg. He's given us the cry. He's given us the words. We must say, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. We've, made, we've been made to know that, haven't we? we? It's not what we produce in any way. It's what he gives freely by his grace. And we come desiring to hear one thing. To hear his word, have forgiveness of sin, forgiveness of what we are. It's only found in one place, in the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness. That's where we come. We've been made to know he ha he's righteous, we're not. We come desiring to hear, fear not, I've put away thy sin. Now unless we are made desperate, we'll never come. Christ said these words, you will not come to me that you may have eternal life. Why? They didn't have the need. They didn't have him as the need. They were speaking to God. How often do we see in scripture the Lord talking to the Pharisees or talking to the scribes has already been mentioned. They were talking to God and they could not see him. They did not hear his voice. They did not know him. They hated him. He told them, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, our fathers ate man in the wilderness he told, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, well, we be of Abraham's seed. He said, you're not of Abraham's seed. If you were, you would, Abraham was glad when he saw my day. Abraham rejoiced. He said, you're of your father, the devil. You don't have a need. I've not given you the need. He said, all that the father give me shall come to me. Why? He gives the need. We have one thing needful. He must give it. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, isn't it? 
he makes the one thing needful. He always fills it with that one, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in the book of Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at a few allegories this morning. Luke chapter 8 has two individuals that come to the Lord for two different needs. One, his name, Jairus, he's a ruler of the synagogue, and he has a daughter that's 12 years old, that she, and she's dying. He says, Lord, I need you to come to my house. I need you to heal my daughter. And the other one is the woman with the issue of blood. You probably are familiar with that account. She had the issue of blood for 12 years as well. Now, one had a 12-year-old daughter that was dying. The other one had an issue of blood for 12 years. Which one had a greater need? Aren't you thankful that the Lord creates the same need regardless of whether we think it's great or whether we think it's small? The need is Christ. They came for Christ. He, I, I've done all I can. I am shut up to Christ. That was both of them. That was the conclusion. That is every believer's conclusion by grace through faith. Christ is all. I've got to have him. Let's read this here in Luke chapter 8, verse, verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. Now, do you remember the publican that was in the temple praying? He would not so much lift up his eye. Do you remember that? Well, here's Jairus falling down at his feet. When the Lord gives us the need, he shows us what we are, who he is, and he shuts us up to Christ. The same response for every believer will happen. We'll fall down and worship. We'll worship him. He fell upon his feet, fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon the physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment and immediately... Her issue of blood staunched. Now, if you think about this account as it's unfolding, as it's taking place, how we would react, how we would respond to this, by nature, we have found the Lord. We're bringing, asking him to come. He says, I'll go to your house. I'll hear your daughter. And he's on the way. And yet, as the crowd presses upon the Lord, this woman realizes that Jesus is passing by. She crawls unto the Lord and she touches the hem of his garment. And the Lord knows that virtue left her. He stops. He stops and he says, who touched me? Now understand something. J. Iris has no time to waste. J. Iris is in a desperate situation. His daughter's dying and the only one that can help has now stopped and he's no longer heading the direction that J. Iris in his mind thinks that the Lord needs to be heading. That's how we are by nature, isn't it? What happens? Well, the woman is made to confess. The virtue left that who she was, her need of the Lord, and she was healed. Look what, look what the Lord says in verse 48. He said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Verse 49 says, While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Now, what's going to be our response to that, naturally speaking? All hope's lost at that point, right? Naturally speaking. Naturally speaking. When desperation, and so oftentimes the Lord creates it in his people, he shuts us up. The Lord's the only one that could have healed the daughter. But you know what faith believes? The Lord's the only one that can raise the daughter from the dead, too. Look what he says right here in the next verse. When Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, fear not. Believe only. Do you know what our need is? No matter the circumstance. Whenever you see that you're a sinner. Whether, it doesn't matter what it is. Our need is to hear the Lord say. Fear not. Peace be still. That song. That, that was a glorious song. It was talking just of that. When the Lord. When the, the waves of our sin beat up against us. Yet the Lord says peace be still. They're gone. They're gone. The Lord's the one that put them away. That's the need. Faith just believes God, not what we see, not the circumstantial evidence. No, we be faith believes the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith rests in him. That's the need we have is to believe on him. 
Only desperate men and women are beggars. Only desperate men and women are beggars. If we have, you're not completely desperate. The Lord, if the Lord hasn't made us completely desperate, we'll never beg. We'll never beg. Why does a beggar beg? It's, if, if you're talking about being a mercy beggar, because that's, that's what we've been shut up to do, we have nothing to offer. We come with no, what was uh, blind Bartimaeus? Did he have any hope in and of himself to approach the Lord and to, to persuade the Lord to, to show him mercy? No, he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the more that they hushed him, the louder he got, didn't he? And finally, the Lord called. For, I love that. The Lord called for him. Lord, call for me. Lord, you've put the, the desire, the cry in my heart. You've given us the desire. Now, Lord, call us unto yourself. Do you know if he's given you the cry, he's already done the calling? He's already done it. He doesn't do that in vain. But how did Bartimaeus approach the Lord as a beggar? Well, number one, he was blind. He was a beggar. But number two, it says he cast his garments to the side. He had no righteousness coming to the Lord. He was completely empty. He was completely naked before God. He said, I have a need only you can feel. I have nothing to offer. Nothing to offer. And what did the Lord say? Be thou made whole. He said, receive thy sight. The Lord gave him, the Lord gave him sight. In the allegory we were at, the, I suppose I should, everybody knows this probably, but the Lord resurrected that young lady. So no matter the need, the Lord met the need. The Lord met the need. But there's a spiritual application there. Somebody said, I'm dead in trespasses and in sin. I have no hope. That's, that's good news. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the power to say live. Live. By his grace, he says live and says come take of the water of life freely. Isaiah 55 says everyone that thirsteth, come. Are you thirsty? Only somebody thirsty will eat. Only somebody hungry will eat. I've got three children, and some of you have children. You've probably done the same thing I have. Supper time in the evening when they were younger, you need to eat your vegetables. You need to eat your food. Well, I'm not hungry. Well, you're going to sit there until you eat them. You're going to sit there for a while until you eat them. Well, time passes by, and either my, I, eventually, they normally won, you know, however it went, whatever. But you don't have to tell someone hungry to eat. If they're starving, if, they have any, if they're in a desert place and they have had no water, if they have had no food, you don't have to tell them to eat. If they're presented with food and water, if it's supplied, they'll eat, they'll drink. Lord makes us desperate, doesn't he? And he gives us that need that only he can feel, the bread of life and the fountain of living water. Everyone that thirsteth, come. Everyone that thirsteth, come. Come ye to the waters, and he hath no money. Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and price. Somebody says, I have nothing to offer. That's, that's good. That's part of the qualification, isn't it? Being a dead dog sinner with nothing to offer. The Lord did that. The Lord does that for his people. Otherwise, we would brag about something we have to, that we can offer. No, it's all been paid for by the blood of the Lamb, hasn't it? We can't, we can't purchase redemption. It's been purchased. We can't add to or take away from it. It's forever settled. Lord, you're going to have to give me this water. You're going to have to give me this bread. You're going to have to cause me to live. And he does. He does. He gives that need, and then he does just that. Now back to our text in Luke chapter 10. I want you to look at Mary here. Either we're begging or we're bragging. What was Mary doing? Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She was not bragging, was she? Matter of fact, she wasn't even speaking. That's what the gospel does, is it shuts us up. We have nothing else to say about us. It's all about him. She was listening. She was hearing. She was observing. She was given understanding of the Lord's words. That's what the Lord's gospel does according to his work. By grace in the heart. That's our need. Lord, give us your gospel. Cause us to hear your word. That's the need that we have, isn't it? 
You remember the Syrophoenician woman? Syrophoenician woman came to the Lord. She was a Gentile. David mentioned this last night. She was an outcast. She was a dog. She had no claim on the promise of being Abraham's seed. And as she comes to the Lord, she asked the Lord for mercy. And the Lord said, it's not meat to give the children's bread unto dogs. And he responded to that after she said, help me. And you, you heard that last night. I, won't, I don't want to add to that. But um, when the Lord said those words to her, it's not meat to give the children's bread unto dogs. She said, truth, Lord. She heard the truth of what she was, of who she was, but she knew who he was as well. See, he had given a need that only he could fill, and it's him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the need. She said, but the dogs desire the crumbs that fall from the master's table. The dogs desire the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I have a few dogs. I have four dogs, to be exact. I know something a little bit about dogs. I have a new dog that's a little bit over a year old, and she... She would risk my wrath every single day of the week in order to have one more crumb or one more morsel fall off my plate. No matter how many times I scold this dog and tell this dog to go lay down, no, I'm not sharing my food with you, this is my food, she continually begs. Why? She's a dog. She's a dog. It's her nature. It's her nature. You know, the Lord gives his people a new nature that begs after one more crumb from his table. He gives his dead dog sinners a need that only he can feel. And he fills that need with the manna from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're made to beg for one more crumb, aren't we? One more morsel of manna, one more drink from the fountain of living water. Now either he gives us this need or he leaves us to ourself. An example of that, for the sake of time, is found in Mark chapter 5. We're not going to turn there, but it's the maniac at Gadara. We know the account. The Lord travels on the uh, sea to him. He condescends from the north part all the way down to the south because he had a need to meet the maniac at Gadara. He goes to the tombs where the man's at. And how was he found? Well, Scripture says that he had been put in chains and in fetters often, but he broke those chains and fetters. And we know that's a picture of false religion. Men trying to make covenants with God. Men saying, I'm going to do my part and they make promises but we can't keep any promise to God it's not our promise it's his isn't it we know that to be true when he saw the master when the master met the maniac the maniac came running to him and fell on his face and worshiped and worshiped and he was the Lord demanded his name and he said legion for we are many and the the uh, spirits asked the Lord to not send them away but that he would send them uh, to the swine that was nearby, and he, he bid them go. They went, and they drowned, the swine drowned themselves in the sea. You know the account. When the farmers, the herdsmen, came and, and found the maniac, how did they find that man? They found him seated at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. They found him clothed, and they found him in his right mind. Now, this man was not given the need for Christ until first Christ came to him. Very important. No man come to the Father but by me. But for every single maniac that is elect of the Lord, he will come to them and he will say unto all the false thoughts that we have of who God is, by his repentance, he'll say, depart. And now we say, truth, Lord. Now we are clothed in his righteousness alone. It's not my righteousness. Now we are seated in his finished work of law. No, we're not seated in our finished work, but his and we're in our right mind. Christ is all. Christ is all. This maniac wasn't coming to Christ. He wasn't coming to Christ. The Lord told the Pharisees, you will not come to me that you may have eternal life. None of us would come to Christ had it not been him first. Seeking and saving his people that were lost. We've been made to have one need. Unless God gives us that need, we will never, never need him. He never gives that need in vain. Every time he gives that need, he fills it with the Lord Jesus Christ. The last allegory I want to uh, mention to you today is found in 2 Kings 5. We're not going to turn there either, but it's Naaman the Syrian. 
Most of these are very familiar. Naaman was captain of the host of Syria. That means he would have been a five-star general. He was in charge. He was uh, an honorable man. He was a mighty man in, in valor. He was a distinguished man. And yet, we can think about all the problems he had. I think Chris may have mentioned this one time. He had a lot of problems until the Lord made him a leper. After that, he had one problem, just one. See, if the Lord doesn't give us that one thing needful, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not come to him. Naaman heard from the servant girl that there was a prophet in Israel, and he goes down to Israel, but he has the wrong mentality about God still. He has the wrong ideal about God. He's going to load up the caravan. He's going to bring the best silver, the gold that he has, everything that he is going to offer. He's going to say, I'm going to uh, give unto this man, and he's going to give unto me healing. That's the, that's the idea of men, isn't it? That's what we, by nature, we think we can do something to obligate God. It's not true. Well, what happened when he got there? Well, Elisha never came out to meet him. Elisha sent the servant and said, Lord says, go down to Jordan which represents death and dip seven times. That's, that's a picture of the perfect death of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Well, Naaman was furious. And he said these words, and me and you, we're guilty of this. We are so guilty of these words, I thought. Is that not the problem that I have and you have all the time? I thought. I thought that this man would come out and he would do this and he would do that. I thought this and I thought that. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He's God. He's God. What happened then? Well, the servant, his servant, Naaman's servant, said, Lord, if he'd have told you to have done some great thing, you'd have done it. Just go dip in the River Jordan seven times. And Naaman did by grace, and he was healed. He was healed of his leprosy. Understand, unless the Lord makes us a leper from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, we will have no need we will, have, we will not glory in the cross of Christ. We will not glory in his perfect death for his people that saved them. We will glory in ourselves. But if he creates that need, he fills that need with the Lord Jesus Christ and causes us to rest in the finished work of Christ alone for our salvation. You and I don't think anymore, do we? Naaman said, I thought. You and I don't think anymore. Faith doesn't process. Faith doesn't compute algorithms. Faith doesn't think. Faith believes Christ. We don't think anymore and try to figure out God. Faith believes the Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that we obtain that? By grace alone. Faith believes the Lord Jesus Christ successfully redeemed. See, he's given us a need, and that need is Christ alone. Christ alone. Faith just believes him. Faith just believes him. Only, we're, only when we're given the need, only when we're 100% leprous, are we declared clean. Only when we're made to see that we're a maniac are we made to see the Lord's put us in our right mind in seeing Christ. Only when we're made a dead dog sinner does the Lord cause a crumb to fall from the master's table. It's not how we see ourselves that saves us, but it's that we see Christ Jesus and his righteousness alone. We desire one more word of life, one more crumb. We have one thing needful to hear him speak. What does the Lord say? The good news of the gospel is this. John chapter 10 tells us, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. If you've been made a maniac, if you've been made a leper, if you've been made a dead dog sinner, if, you've been, if you know that you have an issue of blood from your father Adam that cannot be cleansed by anything that you do, Hear the good news of what the Lord said in Revelation 21. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning of salvation. I am the end of salvation. It is done. It is finished. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. How is it that he gives a thirst to everyone of the fountain of life freely? Them that are thirsty. He's put the thirst there. He put the thirst there. He put the hunger there. The way... 
that you and I would ever come as if he calls us to. But hear what the Spirit and the Bride say. Come. Come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that a thirst say, come. Let him that a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him come take of the water of life for you. I think it was Todd that said this one time. I'm glad that he said whosoever there. More than if it said Caleb Andrew Hickman, come. Because there's many Caleb Andrew Hickmans in the world. But I'm a whosoever. By grace. If you're thirsty, he's put the need there, come. If you're hungry, he's put the need there, come. Will thou be made whole if he's made you a mercy-begging, leprous, vile sinner? Yes. Yes, you'll need to be made whole. You know that he's the only remedy. He's the only remedy. He alone is the one thing needful. Amen. Great. Let's all stand. We'll close with him 318, number 318. <clears throat> Sorry, Joy. 318 in the hardback. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. time we need him more than when we gather together to worship him and uh, we ask the Lord to to be meet that need when we began this service and I believe he has and I'm very thankful the one thing needful is the gospel thank you brothers um, we're going to have lunch together hope you can stay uh, Lord willing we'll Plan to meet back here tomorrow at, uh, at 10 o'clock. And uh, at the conclusion of the service tomorrow, we're going to be able to um, witness uh, a brother in baptism.
confessing Christ in baptism. So we're very thankful for that. And uh, let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for creating a need in our heart for thee. Thank you for meeting that need in the person of thy dear Son and the glorious gospel of your grace. Lord, you've fed our souls now with the bread of life, for surely his body is our meat indeed, and his blood is our drink indeed. And we thank you for the, for the nourishment that you have given to our souls. Lord, we pray now that you would bless our fellowship. We thank you for the food that we're about to receive physically and thank you, Lord, for the, for the nourishment of our bodies that you provide. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Right, you're dismissed. <laughs>